Hey y'all, so we decided to take the advice of our friends over at Killen's Pond and take a trip down to the coast. We were thinking we should go to one of our most interesting parks here at Delaware State Parks, and that's Delaware Seashore State Park. And just the drive down here through the park, we've seen so many neat things from bays to beaches. We've even passed over this huge bridge where it looks like the bay actually touches the ocean. So with all of this great stuff going on, we knew we should find another park expert to go and tell us and teach us a little bit more about what their parks have to offer. All right, so we came down to the Indian River Life Saving Station and Museum to learn a little bit more about Delaware Seashore State Park. This is Laura, the Interpretive Programs Manager here. Hi, I'm so glad that you're here today. Uh, so again, my name's Laura, I'm the Interpretive Programs Manager at Delaware Seashore. And uh, we've been, I know you guys have been traveling the state talking about water and um, you're ending up here at Delaware Seashore where literally we are surrounded by water. So Delaware Seashore is a six and a half mile stretch of barrier beach. It's not technically an island, but we've got Rehoboth and Indian River Bays to the west. We've got the Atlantic Ocean to the east. And there's even a connection between us right down to the south of us um, is the Indian River Inlet. Um, so there's water everywhere. And uh, this building right here behind us, this beautiful building is the Indian River Life Saving Station Museum. Um, it's built in 1876. So it is one of the oldest oceanfront buildings still standing in Delaware. Cool. Um, it's kind of like an old Coast Guard station. Mm -hmm. And so we teach people about the men who served here from about 1876 to 1915, how they patrolled the beaches and some of the heroic rescues that they performed. Oh. Um, and this site is right smack in the middle of the park and it's really the main visitor center. So um, when visiting the park, usually people stop here first. So thanks for telling us a little bit about the park. And you said something about that huge bridge that goes over the inlet there. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because it's so interesting, especially when you're going over it. Yeah, so people don't realize it, um, it's a really dynamic waterway. Mm -hmm. um, over the last 200 years, it's shifted and changed shape and changed location along this coast. Um, so it has a really interesting history. Uh, the bridge that's going over it now is the fifth bridge to span the inlet over the since uh, the early 1930s. Um, but Let's go down and check it out. Great, let's do it. All right, so we just made our way to the south side of the Indian River Inlet, which is right behind us here. And uh, right underneath the iconic Indian River Inlet Bridge, which spans the, uh, the entire width of the inlet, and that is Coastal Highway Route 1. And um, yeah, so here we are. Awesome, so Laura, when we were at uh, Brandywine River and Killen's Pond, the interpreters there told us about how humans use the water resources there to their benefit, whether for the water power or for travel or something. Did people use this water resource here? Absolutely. So um, when we were at the life saving station, I mentioned um, the men that patrolled the beaches who served at that mm -hmm. station and, and they would look for ships in distress. And uh, our station, the Indian River Station, actually responded to more shipwrecks than some of the neighboring wow. Delaware stations just because of this waterway, this Indian River Inlet. It can be a really treacherous area to navigate. Even today, the current going through it is very, very strong. Mm -hmm. um, and this area, the inlet was used for um, commerce. So uh, farmers might have crops they needed to get out into the ocean and up, up the Delaware Bay to Philadelphia. So there's a lot of uh, boat traffic happening at the time. So this, this inlet is an extremely important waterway to Delaware. My next question would be, where does this inlet go to down there? Um, well, uh, so we've got the Atlantic Ocean here, and when we have an incoming tide, we get a huge rush of water that comes through the inlet, and it fills into the, uh, it trickles into the Indian River Bay and Rehoboth Bay. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are some freshwater tributaries that will lead down from uh, further inland down into the bay, um, and then you have the salt water coming in, and it mixes, and that creates brackish water, oh. um, which um, in our inland bays, uh, brackish water is key to uh, what species are living there um, and the, the entire ecosystem that we have here on the coast. Very cool. Do you mind if we go check out one of those? Yeah, I'm thinking Holt's Landing. What do you think? Let's do it. All right. All right, y'all. So we decided to come down to Holt's Landing where Laura and her fellow naturalist Maggie have taken us out to this really awesome marshy beach spot. Uh, to not only tell us about some of the cool animals they find in this brackish water where that inlet we showed you earlier leads into, but to show us how they go out and catch some of these animals, um, just taking you right into one of their programs they would do on a normal basis. 
All right, yeah, so um, Maggie and I are gonna take this net out into the bay. Um, we're, we're not gonna take it far. We can actually usually catch pretty cool stuff really close to shore. Um, it's nice that we have the marsh. We have a sandy shoreline right here that we're standing on. It's low tide and we've got some rock habitat. So we do find a mixture of uh, different fish in this area. Um, and as you were saying, uh, we get this uh, the saltwater source over by the inlet where we just were, um, and then up up the Indian River. That's where our, our freshwater sources come down. So with with the changing tides and rain and uh, the the salinity levels can change quite a bit here in Indian River Bay. So everything that we catch is specifically adapted to living in a brackish water environment where the cons the the salinity levels are constantly changing. Okay. All right, so Laura and Maggie just went out and did the seine in and bring, by bringing this net all throughout that water and catching a couple of different types of fish here. And so we have them all gathered in this little kiddie pool. And Laura, what are we looking at here? Uh, well, we're looking at a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, so I'm gonna start out with the, the slowest of them all. And I'll get, do you wanna hold one too? Yeah. Here. All right, just make sure your hands are wet first. Um, it's always good to have your hands wet so they're not damaging any of the oils on the skin, or your oils aren't damaging the, the fish at all. Um, so right here we've got eastern mud snails, and um, these are very abundant in the bays and a really important food source for our terrapins and uh, the diamondback terrapin, which um, I might talk about a little bit later. Um, this one's already getting, this one's not shy, it's starting to wander around on my hand. Um, these are everywhere in shallow water in our brackish, in, in the brackish water, the shallow waters of the bay. And um, wow, yours is rolling around. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Um, if you ever hold one of these and they're not coming out of their shell, what they say is that they like to feel vibrations. It makes them curious. So if you stick your, your chin on your hand and hum, mm -hmm. it makes them a little bit more active. And this one's still wandering around. Um, Maggie, is yours moving? Yep, it came out. Cool. Um, so yeah, these are eastern mud snails. So that's one thing. Let's see what else we have. You can put those back in the water. All right, so this is this is called a naked goby. Um, it has really, if you touch it, it's really, really smooth, more so than some of the other fish. Um, they don't really have scales. That's hence the name naked goby. Another thing we've got, we have some killifish. And it's really cool with killifish. You can tell the difference between um, male and female. And we have a little rhyme that helps us remember the difference. We say males are in jail. And so they have <laughs> vertical stripes that look like jail bars. And so um, and the, the female has horizontal stripes. Can you tell me the difference between male and female right here in this bucket? I you can pick one up if you want. I want to say this one is a male. You got it. So it has vertical stripes. And then I'll pick up the female here. Woo, she's spicy. Um, it has those horizontal stripes. She does not want to show us right now. There we go. Um, so that's how you can tell the difference. Um, they don't get a lot larger than this one right here. So um, I'm pr really excited that we caught such large fish. We've got a couple different Atlantic blue crabs. Oh. that you're an expert oh and that's a female see she has that's an immature female she has a triangular shape on her her belly there her abdomen whereas a full grain grown female would have a semicircle mm -hmm. and then the males have like a a vertical look it almost looks like a little rocket ship on the bottom oh, okay. so that's how you can tell the difference and while we're on the topic of crabs notice that we were very careful handling 
handling those crabs. This one I'm just going to grab out of here. This one can't pinch me. Do you have any idea why? Whoa, it's soft. It's really soft. So crabs do molt um, on a regular basis and uh, they will shed their hard shell and underneath they will be a soft shell for a short amount of time. This, this will eventually harden just like mm -hmm. the other crabs that we have here. So this one's quite vulnerable. That's why I had it in a different container. I didn't want the other crabs to antagonize this yeah. one. Um, and that is a male. That's the, uh, the Oh yeah, the, the rocket, rocket ship. ship I was kind of talking about. So yeah. if you have a soft shell, you can hold them and they cannot pinch you because their their claws are just real flimsy. They don't really have any uh, power to them. Oh, yeah. But once that hardens, he'll be able to pinch you for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so you showed us all these crabs and fish in this kiddie pool here, but I love turtles. What is that? <laughs> so this is, whoa, she just got very excited. <laughs> yeah. um, this is diamondback terrapin. It's the most Populous, meaning there's no, it's of all the turtle species, we find these the most diamondback mm -hmm. terrapins in Delaware Seashore and Holtz Landing State Park. And the reason for that is um, we have their habitat. They are exclusively brackish water turtles. So we've mentioned brackish water several times. Mm -hmm. um, and then these turtles are specifically adapted to those changing salinity levels. And um, this is a female, and I know that um, because. She was out wandering around, and usually that's because um, turtles come out, uh, the females come out of the bay on land to find a sandy place to mm -hmm. dig a hole and lay their eggs. Um, but one thing I like to tell people, if you ever find a terrapin mm -hmm. on the road, in the park, in a parking lot, anywhere, um, and it has a risk of being hit by a car, which this one did when we found it this morning, mm -hmm. to pick it up, you can pick it up with two hands, um, like this, thumbs on the top, fingers on the bottom, and walk it to the side of the road in the direction it was facing. So where it was going to. Yeah. Yes, okay. um, but obviously your safety's first. Don't get out of the car if it's not safe for you. Um, or you can hold it with one hand. If you've got strong hands in the back, then they can't use their back legs to scratch you really. Okay. So, um, But one way to identify is those big white lips right there. Hey. Kind of cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's cool. Do you have any other types of points you want to make on how we can continue to protect these wonderful areas like this that are just filled with all these wildlife creatures? Um, I think the... The, there's all kinds of things you can do. Mm -hmm. I could talk to you for hours about how you can sure. um, help the quality of the water and all kinds of stuff. But I think really the, the overall thing is to educate, spread the word, what we're doing, share. If, if you've learned something today, um, share it with your family at home. Just kind of spread the word about the importance of all these yeah. creatures um, and the significance of the history that we talked about earlier. And once people have an appreciation for something, they're going to work to protect it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Laura. I appreciate you showing us around your park. This has yeah. been a wonderful time. We've learned so much. Thank you, little little lady. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Wow, what an exciting day of traveling all around the parks and across our state. Water really plays a significant role for our communities and our planet. I had no idea how much our own history has been affected by the rivers, bays, and ponds around us, or just how many animals call these places home. But there was another important lesson that we have learned today. While water can be powerful, alive, and all around fascinating, it can also be threatened. And the animals and plants that live in and near these bodies of water can be threatened too. So how can we make sure we continue to protect these areas and the animals and plants that call them home? Well, at Alapocos Run, we learned to not dump any strange liquids, foods, trash, or debris into our rivers, and to leave things the same or even better than how we found them. At Killen's Pond, we learned how to reuse and recycle even the easiest things like plastic water bottles. And finally, at Delaware Seashore, Laura taught us that one of the most important things we can do is just share these lessons with our friends and families at home. So I hope that you all learned as much about these cool places and animals as I did, from the rushing water of the Brandywine River to the man-made Killen's Pond and the calm, scenic inland bays by the beach. We are so happy you all got to come along with us exploring your state parks and understanding more about how water is important to us. So let's thank all of the naturalists we got the chance to talk to today and who are happy to teach us a little bit more about the parks. We would love to talk to you more about what we got to see today, and we will be live in studio to show off some awesome activities you can do featuring some of the interesting concepts and animals we talked about. So see you there.